Welcome again to our lectures on statistics. This lecture is delivered specially for the students uh, whose major is foreign language, two foreign languages, starting at the Department of English and German Languages. The theme of this lecture is intensification of a feature, simile, hyperbole, periplicis. Within this lecture, we will consider the following points. First of all, we'll talk about the general information concerning intensification of a certain feature or the thing or phenomenon. And then we'll discuss stylistic devices in more detail, such as simile, hyperbole, periphrasis, and euphemism. As you have noticed from the previous lectures, um, stylistic devices can be classified according to three criteria. The interaction of different types of lexical meaning, intensification of a feature, and peculiar use of set expressions. Today's lecture is devoted to the second criterion of this classification given by Galperin, intensification of a feature. In this group of stylistic devices, we find that one of the qualities of the object in question is made to sound essential. This is an entirely different principle from that on which the previous group is based, that of interaction between two lexical meanings simultaneously materialized in the context. In this group, the quality picked out may be seemingly unimportant and it is frequently transitory, but for a special reason, it is elevated to the greatest importance and made into a telling feature. Well, within, within this group, we will consider such stylistic devices as simile, hyperbole, periphrasis, and euphemism. First of all, we'll talk about simile. The reader's understanding is immeasurably increased if he is familiar with the many techniques or devices of poetry. Some of these are extremely simple, a few are rather elaborate. The simplest and also the most effective poetic device is the use of comparison. It might almost be said that poetry is founded on two main means of comparing things, simile and metaphor. It is a comparison between two things, a thought or message conveyed by the writer to the reader. One should be careful not to confuse ordinary comparison and simile. Let's take an example. My sister is as clever as your teacher. In this sentence, two objects, sister and teacher, belong to the same, to one class of things, with the purpose of establishing the degree of sameness. That is why the example above is an ordinary comparison. Now let us take, take another example. She is like a rose. The two objects belong entirely to different class of things. And it is not an ordinary comparison, but it is already a simile. Similes have formal elements in their structure, connective words like, as, such as, as if, or seem. For instance, he had a posture like a question mark. He fights like a lion. He swims as fast as a fish. He slithers like a snake. She walks as gra gracefully and elegantly as a cat. He was as a lion in the fight. We heighten our ordinary speech by the continual use of such comparisons as fresh as a daisy, tough as leather, 
comfortable as an old shoe. It fits like the paper on the wall, gay as a lock, pretty as a picture. It was that moment of the year when the countryside seems to faint from its own loveliness, from the intoxication of its scents and its sounds. In this example given by John Goldsworthy, the simile is half a metaphor. If not for the structural word seem, we would call it a metaphor. Indeed, if we drop the word seems and say the countryside faints from, the clue word faint becomes a metaphor. But the word seems keeps apart from the notions of stillness and fainting. It is a simile where the second member, the human being, is only suggested by means of the concept faint. The semantic nature of the simile forming elements seem and as if is such that they only remotely suggest resemblance. Quite different are the connectives like and as. These are more categorical and establish quite straightforwardly the analogy between the two objects in question. As you noticed, similes have recognizable structure. They use connective words. If metaphors equate two ideas despite their differences, similes allow the two ideas to remain distinct in spite of their similar similarities. For instance, if we want to compare a woman to a rose, a metaphor might read something like, she is a rose, and a simile, she is like a rose. A metaphor is actually a condensed simile, for it emits as or like. The most commonplace similes offer a window into the stereotypes that pervade a given language and culture. For example, the following similes convey a stereotypical view of people, animals, and things. As precise as a surgeon, as regular as a clock, as cunning as a fox, as strong as an ox, as sour as vinegar, as quiet as a mouse. These similes have the status of a cliché of platitude in English, and their use is typically taken to signify a lack of creative imagination. Some stereotypical similes express viewpoints that are technically incorrect, but which are widespread in a culture, such as as cruel as a wolf, as stubborn as a goat, as drunk as a skunk, as violent as a gorilla, as proud as a peacock. Similes do not have to be accurate to be meaningful or useful. To be as proud as a peacock is to be very proud, whether peacock, peacocks actually do exhibit pride or not. What matters is that peacocks are commonly believed to be exemplary examples of proud behavior. Main stylistic function of a simile is the intensification of some feature of the concept. Hyperbole is another lexical stylistic device with the function of intensification. It is a deliberate overstatement or exaggeration, the aim of which is to intensify one of the features of the object in question to such a degree as to sometimes show its utter absurdity. It is aimed at exaggerating quantity or quality, and it is one of the common expressive means of our everyday speech. For example, I have told you thousands of times, I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Due to long and repeated use, hyperboles have lost their originality. Thus, like many stylistic devices, Hyperbole may lose its quality of a genius stylistic device through frequent repetition. 
Here there are some examples. A thousand pardons, scared to death, immensely obliged. Hyperbole is a device which sharpens the reader's ability to make a logical assessment of the utterance through deliberate exaggeration. This is the main information about hyperbole presented in the diagram. So, the definition of hyperbole is a figure of speech which is an exaggeration, and it is used to emphasize a feeling, reaction, or effort. Some features of hyperbole are as follows. Statements aren't necessarily true, but should not be taken literally. Hyperbole is often confused with similes and metaphors. And some popular examples of hyperbole are I nearly died laughing. Oh, I'm, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Hyperbole can be expressed by all notional parts of speech. It is important that both communicants should clearly perceive that the exaggeration serves not to denote actual quality or quantity, but signals the emotional background of the utterance. The most important function of hyperbole is the emotional expressiveness. If this reciprocal understanding is absent, hyperbole turns into a mere lie. Hyperboles often create the pathetic and comic effect. Literature has an urgent necessity of the artistic exaggeration of reflection of the world. For example, I would do anything in the world to ensure your happiness. The next stylistic device within this group is periphrases. Periphrases originate from the Greek word periphrasen, which means talking around. It is a stylistic device that can be defined as the use of excessive and longer words to convey a meaning which could have been conveyed with a shorter expression or in a few words. It is an indirect or roundabout way of writing about something. For example, when that fell arrest without all bail shall carry me away. These are lines from Sonnet 74 by William Shakespeare. In this extract, Shakespeare is explaining death and its consequences. He has used an indirect way of illustrating death as when that fell. Here it means when death comes. No one would be able to save him. Another example is from The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde. I was within a hair's breadth of the last opportunity for pronouncement, and I found with humiliation that probably I would have nothing to say. In the above passage, periphrasis is employed to describe Earnestness. This idea could be understood in different ways. In the text, it is given as the opposite of pettiness, but, also, but elsewhere it is explained as the reverse of seriousness. The definition of periphrasis is very similar to that of circumlocution, which also means talking around something by adding more words. The difference is that the meaning is still understandable in an example of periphrasis, whereas circumlocution often obscures the meaning so as to make it indecipherable. A few similar words in English come from the same etymological roots, such as phrase, paraphrase, and holophrasis. Paraphrase uses the prefix para, meaning beside, near, resembling, and the prefix hollow means whole, completely. Thus, 
Paraphrase means to express something in a way that resembles the original. Holophrasis, meanwhile, is the opposite concept of to periphrasis, as it means to express a complex set of ideas in a single word or fixed phrase. There is a variety of periphrases which can be called euphemistic. Euphemism is a figure of speech commonly used to replace a word or phrase that is related to a concept which might make others un uncomfortable. Euthemism refers to figurative language designed to replace phrasing that would otherwise be considered harsh, impolite, or unpleasant. This literary device allows for someone to say what they mean indirectly, without using literal language, as a way of softening the impact of what is being said. The reason for this would be for the sake of politeness, discretion, and other means of mitigating communication. Euphemisms are used for certain abstractions, such as death, sex, aging, getting fired, bodily functions, and others. The examples of euphemisms are as follows. Economically challenged, for the word poor. Thin on top, which means bold. Correctional facility, for the, for the notion of prison. Between jobs, for the word unemployed. Passed away, kicked the bucket, departed, gone, resting in peace. And many other euphemisms can be used for the notion of death. This is all in brief concerning the content of this lecture, uh, concerning the stylistic devices uh, classified according to the criterion of intensification of a certain feature. And as a rule, you are suggested a set of comprehension questions. Be sure to answer them. And at the end of the lecture, you are given, you are provided with a list of sources for your further reading and studying. Thank you for attention.